Hashem Hashem Na'asev Na'asliyah. Welcome to our series of Tablespoon of Reality. Um, we are on our fourth part of this shiur. We are ending off the chapter of Emet. Finding the truth. Or as I call it, you can't handle the truth. So it's uh, good to see some uh, familiar faces back. Uh, Mr. Yushalmi, welcome back. We missed you. Um, everybody else, welcome. So last week we discussed certain aspects of finding the truth in life. Finding the emet, really looking for the emet. Ha'adam malekushot, a person is, um, I should say, before we start, this is, um, this shiur is dedicated, they're dedicated for the refu'an shalema of Moshe Rabbeinu ben Eliza and also Asher Ruach ben Hana Serel Malka and Kol Cholam Israel and uh, also Lilim Nishmat, my father, Allah Shalom, Rafael ben Monavar. Ha'adam Malek Hushot, a person is, people are filled with questions. But many times, many people don't want answers. We don't look for answers. We just, we're comfortable having our questions. And we're going to delve into why this is so. Haramchal Besifro Mesilad Yisharim, the famous Sefer Mesilad Yisharim of the Ramchal, says beautifully, and I think anyone that has not read or had any classes on the um, Sefer of Mesilad Yisharim, um, this should be something on their list, their to-do list. The Ramchal says in Mesilad Yisharim, Sheigar Chobat HaAdam Ba'olam Azehu Sheitbarer Veit Amet Etzlo Mahi Chobato Ba'olam the purpose of a person in life, if someone asks you right now, what is the purpose of life? What would you say the purpose of life is? Uh, what would anyone answer to that question? What is the purpose of life? I don't know. Make a lot of money and uh, uh, help people and build and have children. Definitely have children. That, that would be probably one of the number one answers. The Ramchal says, the purpose of a person's life is sheith bayer, beit amet etzlo, that it should be clear and become truth for him, mahi chovato ba'olamo. What is his purpose? What is his, what is his responsibility in his life? But this is, very in, this, is a, this is a line in the Ramchal that has many, many mefarshim that talk about it much. There has been books written on just this one line. And I believe the Ramchal, when he wrote this sefer, was 16 years old. And literally, one-liners have many mefarshim discussing them. Just to tell you who the Ramchal was, Rav Moshe Chaim Lutzato. This line, he says, that a person in life has to search to see what his purpose is in life. However, the wording that he uses is, Ve'it etzlo mai chovato ba'olamo. What is his purpose? He has to search to see what is his purpose. Be'olamo. What does olam mean in Hebrew? Olam means world. So we translate it as he has to figure out what is his purpose in life. However, it's written ba'olamo, in his world. This is where Chachamim say that the Ramchal is trying to make us understand that each person in this world has come to quite literally build a world. Each person is an olam male. Each actual individual is not just that person. We come in this world and we build a world. That's why the, uh, the famous uh, phrase of Chazal is that a person that saves one Jew has saved an entire world. That's where the Ramchal is coming, bringing this as well. Each person has a world to create. When we come in this world, with the mitzvot that we do, with the things that we do to clo get closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, we are, we are able to build a world. And chas v'shalom, if we don't do justice with that world, after 120 years, that world is going to be damaged. It's a product that we've made with our labor in this world. So the Ramcha says, that is each person's responsibility to figure out what is their purpose in their world. What kind of world are you supposed to build? What are you supposed to do to build this world? So why don't people regularly ask themselves, what is my purpose? What am I supposed to do? What's life for? 
okay, I went to a school. I became the doctor that my mommy and daddy wanted to me to be. I became the whatever that so-and-so wanted me to be. Uh, I made the money that I wanted to make, maybe not as much as I wanted to, but I'm okay. And then what? What is really the purpose of all of this? Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olam shehakol nehiyah bidvaro. And a person also should ask themselves, why was I created as a human being? And then on top of that, why was I created as a Jew? There's a difference between just being created as a human being and being created as a Jew. There's a big difference. Why not? Why, why wasn't I created just like anybody else in the world? Why did I have to be created a Jew? Now, we're not saying a Jew is better than other people, but definitely different. So why was I created in this religion of God? Do I have certain responsibilities? And that's a yes. Absolutely. A person is created as a Yehudi, as a Jew, because we have a higher purpose. We have a responsibility. Was it Spider-Man? What is his mom, his mom told him or something? With great power comes great responsibility. That's a line from all Jewish books. A Jew is created as in the Mamlechet Kohanim Vegoy Kadosh, in a nation of priests and a holy nation, which means we have to act and be different. We have a different purpose in life. And we have to ask, we have to constantly ask, well, what's my purpose? What am I supposed to be doing? I mean, that's it. Comes Rosh Hashanah, get together with the family, and because I'm Jewish, because it's great to be Jewish, because... It gives you a lot of family time. A lot of times people keep reminding a person what they're supposed to be doing. They try to convince them. But unfortunately, many of us rather stick with the questions. We'd rather stay in the dark than come fully into the light and understand the truth. The Gemara Chagiga brings in Tetvav Amud Bet the, uh, the famous story of Elisha ben Abuya. Elisha ben Abuya was one of the greatest Chachamim of his generation. He was one of the four that actually entered into the Pardes, into the garden of God, so to speak, with his body, he was allowed, he was one of the four people that was allowed to enter into the next world with his body to see certain things and experience certain things. Imagine being a human being that has been led to, into heaven with their body and their soul to experience what it's like on the other side. Beim Korzot, with all of that, Kafar Batora. He completely became a kafir, kofer. He became a heretic completely and left everything. And he would, he would go as far as riding a horse on Shabbat, on Shabbat and Yom Kippur on Shabbat. And, and he himself used to say that he has heard God himself or a heavenly voice say, Everyone is allowed to do teshuva, and I will accept their teshuva. Chutz me Elisha Acher, except for Elisha Acher or Ben Abuya. Elisha, afterwards, in 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 Sefarim, is called Acher, Acher, which means the other. He went so far out. He was such a big Talmid Chacham, but he left everything and he went so far the opposite. He was called the Acher, Acher, the other one. Um, Esfani is in. Uh, 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 um, interestingly, Esfahanis have the custom that it's like it's it's a part of the Esfahani old language, like the Mama Lashen, Mama Lashen, which means the mother's language. Um, that uh, when someone would leave the religion or someone would be Chas Shalom would become crazy or something like that, they would say he became Acher. You know, there's a lot of biblical words that are used in old Jewish languages, like Yiddish and Mahalei Asfahani. So Asfahani used to call them Acher. This is where it comes from. 
אלישה, became, בני, אלישה בן אבויה, became אחר. ומה גרם לו להגיע מגובה שכזה, לשאול תחתית כזה שכזו? What happened? Why did Elisha go from such heights? Why, what happened that he left everything, even though he was the kind of person that was allowed entry into heaven with only three other people? What happened? So there's a lot of answers, like quite few answers. But Yerushalmi in, um, Talmud Yerushalmi in Chagiga says, one time he was sitting down, um, and he saw, he saw that somebody was climbing a tree to go and do the mitzvah of Shiluach HaKen. The mitzvah of Shiluach HaKen is that when you see a mother bird sitting on its uh, uh, eggs, the mitzvah, there's a mitzvah de oraita that says you shall shoo away the, uh, the bird and take the eggs. It's a mitzvah de oraita. Now you don't have to keep, take the eggs and keep them. You can put them back. The mitzvah is only to just, you know, Take the eggs and shoo away the mother. Now there's a lot of halachot involved. Don't just see any bird and do it because, you know, you have to ask a competent rabbi to tell you exactly how to do the exact mitzvah. But Elisha ben Abuya sees this person go up the ladder to go and shoo away the mother bird and take the eggs. And this is a chok from the Torah. We don't know what the reason is. We don't know why Hashem wants us to do this, but this is one of the mitzvot of the oraita. And the Torah says over there, that the reward for doing this mitzvah is longevity, a long life. In order for you to have a long life. That's the, that's, that's the reward of this mitzvah. So Elisha watches as a person climbs a ladder to go up and do this mitzvah. And he fell off the ladder. He did the mitzvah. He fell off the ladder and he passed away. He died. And it says that Elisha ben Avia at that point he said this 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 is this is this is the mitzvot and this is the reward. The Torah itself says that if you do this mitzvah, you gain a longevity, you gain a long life. What happened? This guy did the mitzvah that's supposed to give you a long life during the mitzvah. Right when he does the mitzvah, he falls and he dies. Forget about it. I'm done with it. I'm not doing it anymore. And that's when he left everything. But. The Gemara says in Kedushim clearly, when it says "Leman yitavlach ve'archta yemim le'olam shekulo tov ul'olam shekulo orech," the Gemara says the promise that God gives a person with this mitzvah is not a long life on this earth. It's talking about the life, the eternal life, that you will have great reward in the next world, not in this world. Ve'yesh omrim, and there are those that say shara chazir. גוררת רבי חוצפית המתורגמן. רבי חוצפית המתורגמן was one of the one of the uh, ten הרוגי מלכות, those that uh, ימח שמם Romans tortured and killed. He was a big, very big Talmud Chacham. And they say that they were reincarnated souls of the ten Shavatim, the ten tribes. The ten tribes when they sold Yosef HaTzadik to Mitzrayim after um, after Yosef revealing to them that it was him and he had become the, 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 the Moshel, he had become the assistant to Paro in Mitzrayim, it says that over there that their sin wasn't completely erased. Therefore, they had to come back. So they came back once again into this world as the Aseret Harugem Malchut, which were the ten people that were tortured by the Romans and they were killed. And they were huge Chachamim. And one of them was Rabbi Chutzpit. And what happened is that he was, they had tortured him and he was being dragged by pigs in mud and it was, it was, a, it was a horrific sight to see. And it says that Elisha ben Avuyah saw this and he said, this, this is, this is, this is Ze Torah, ve Zeh this is Torah. This is the person that taught Torah, learned Torah, and this is its reward. This can't be. And he left. So basically, he saw things in life that he couldn't answer, he couldn't understand. So he became a kafar vaikar. He left everything. And I mean everything. He used to write, just to tell you who he was, he was, everyone knows Rabbi Me'ir Ba'al Hanes. Everybody knows the name. Aneni, aneni, alahad Me'ir aneni. We say it on uh, Yom Kippur, we say it. Rabbi Me'ir Ba'al Hanes. 
Elisha ben Avuya was the Rebbe of Rabbi Meir Baal Hanes. And even after he turned and he became completely against Torah and mitzvot, Rabbi Meir was used to still learn from him. You used to still understand and try to learn things from him. So just to give us an understanding of who he was. And even he left. He left. Why? Because he saw this is the two different um, shatim that is given by Chachamim as to what it is that made him leave everything. Bezohi sibat kefirato. Ach lechol hadirot hayulo she'elot. But however, we have to understand, life is filled with questions. Not only questions, but questions without any answers. But that's, that shouldn't bring us to disbelieve everything. Because that's not in search of the truth. It is all an excuse. All these questions that we bring ourselves to have, right? And to say, you know what? Why did so and so happen? You know what? Forget about it. I'm not, that's it. No more Torah, no more mitzvot, no more Judaism. I'm done with it. If we really, really, really look deep down, we really only have these questions because we feel like. It's good. If I have these questions, it's like me putting my head in the sand like an ostrich, and then nothing can hurt me. I can go and follow, pursue all my different desires in life. I can do whatever I want, and no one's going to give me two cents of opinion of why I'm doing it. Why? Because look, look at what happened. Uh, and a lot of people, unfortunately, even today, a lot of people bring an excuse of the Holocaust. I've mentioned this before. Not even survivors. Survivors that, that have questions that you can't even talk about. You can't even talk to them because the, the things they've gone through, we can't even fathom. They are highly respected people and there's no way we could ever question them. But other people that have watched or seen this or know about it sometimes go, oh yeah, if God exists or if, if God is so great, why did the Holocaust happen? Now, I always like to bring this example. It's interesting. Um, a person goes. A person decides to go and, and and take a tour of NASA, of NASA, and he takes a wonderful tour. And he's going from room to room, and he's being shown everything that uh, you know NASA builds and the, these scientists working on different things. And he's seeing machinery that he's never seen in his life. He's seeing different kinds of uh, gadgets that he's never imagined before, room to room, room to room, There's, it's filled with everything. Finally, they bring him into the shuttle and he sees all the things in the shuttle and it's magnificent. It's a work of art, right? Finally, at the end, the guy says, okay, you know, we're, we're done with our tour for today. Uh, do you have any questions? And the guy says, yeah, in fact, I do have a question. He says, go ahead, shoot. I'd like to know what, what, what that button does. What is, I can't understand, what is that button for? So the scientist looks at him and he says, uh, you fool. Out of all the hours of touring that we've gone through today, showing you everything that NASA does, the only question that you have, the only thing you don't understand is what this button does. Everything else in this, in this, in this, world of science you understand but the only thing you didn't understand was that little button that's our life that's how we sound when we ask why did that have to happen oh yeah you understand everything else the only thing you don't understand is why that happened and everything else you understand Moshe Rabbeinu asked this question perfectly and this is a question that we have in life the philosophical question of why do bad things happen to good people? Everyone has this question. There's lectures and lectures. I've done lectures on this. Many have done lectures on it. Why do bad things happen to good people? It's a very, very tough question. Yet, the answer is not so tough. We have to understand, Moshe Rabbeinu had this question. 
So it's not like we're saying the question doesn't exist. Always it exists. It very much so exists, and it's a very real question. However, we ask it wrong most of the times. We ask the question incorrectly. Moshe Rabbeinu, however, asked it correctly. He said to Hashem when he said, I want to see your doings. I want, I, I want to understand your doings. Hachamim say Moshe Rabbeinu asked a question. He said, Hashem, I want to understand. Why do bad things happen to good people? And I also want to understand why do good things happen to good people? I also want to understand why do bad things happen to bad people? And I also don't understand why the good things happen to bad people. I don't understand any of it. I want to know how you work. I want to know your mechanism. To which Chachamim say, for our understanding, for us to understand, Hashem showed Moshe Rabbeinu the back of his tefillin. The knot of his tefillin, which the commentators say, it was a way of showing Moshe Rabbeinu, look, there are some things that you just don't understand. See, the box of the tefillin is in the front. It looks very nice and, you know, um, so perfect and square. However, if you look in the back, there is a knot in there. You can't even tell how this knot was done. If it opens, a person that's not an expert can't even retie it. It's a knot that looks crazy. That's life. Moshe Rabbeinu was telling HaKadosh Baruch Hu, I don't understand any of it. I don't get none of it. I'm not going to assume that I understand why so-and-so that's such a great tzaddik is so wealthy. Am I going to be, am I going to be, am I going to say that, ah, oh, he's wealthy because he's such a tzaddik? Well, that guy is also a tzaddik and he barely has to eat. Or I've seen people that are really bad and you have it great in life. And let's be honest, we have seen people that are not good people and they don't have it good in life. So we can't always say, you know what? Why do bad things happen to good people? Why don't we ask why do good things happen to good people? What we do, do we understand why good things happen to good people? No. That's not how life works. All the schar, all the reward that Hashem has given us in the Torah is talking about the world to come. This world is filled with questions. Filled with questions. Our purpose is to find out what it is that we're supposed to be doing in our world. And a lot of times, we're going to hit bumps. We're going to hit rocky roads. And so be it. That's how it is. And a lot of times, when we do hit those rocky roads, we don't have answers. Now, we have a choice. We either throw in the towel and we say, you know what? That's it. There is no God. Because I can't understand why He's doing this. It's like a child that goes to the doctor with his mom. Baby. Obviously, the baby knows that the mother would do anything for him. Anything. Yet, he's caught with a crazy question. Why is his mother holding him down as the doctor puts a needle inside his body and causes him so much pain? Now, a child can't understand that. Even if the mother explains it, the child doesn't understand it. So all the mother has to do is say, shh, it's okay. It'll be okay. That's life. Life is full of vaccines in different forms. A lot of times we don't have the answers. But HaKadosh Baruch Hu knows all. You could either be like Elisha ben Abuya, Acher, who left everything because of questions, when he knew he was wrong, and he knew he was wrong because he had a bad call. Rabbi Meir Balanes told him, listen, do teshuvah, come back. And he said, what are you talking about? I myself heard the bad call that said, I can't return. And Rabbi Meir tells him, you're still hearing bad calls. Do you understand? You're still hearing heavenly voices. You have a chance. Normal people don't hear heavenly voices. Either we could be like Elisha ben Abuya, or we could be like Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu asked the question correctly. I don't understand anything. Who said I understand any, any ways of God? Who said I'm supposed to understand any ways? Did Moshe Rabbeinu go through very, uh, a little amount of hardship in his life? Moshe Rabbeinu had his own, uh, you know, 
For 40 years, he was thrown out of Egypt and, he, and they wanted to kill him. I mean, all of our avot that became the forefathers that we know of today through, went through a lot of hardship. But they didn't ask. They didn't ask. They, they say a story about Rav Chaim Evolution, the Evolution of Rav. He had a Tommy, he had a student of his that left everything. And he became, you know, he, he joined the Ascala movement and he became an academic. And, you know, and he was a very good Talmud when he was his student. He was a very bright person, but he left everything. After years, he came back to his Rebbe out of respect to speak to him. And they say that in his, in his talk with his Rebbe, he said, Rebbe, I have a lot of questions about our religion. I have a lot of questions about Judaism. So his Rebbe said, go ahead, shoot. And he started, you know, asking all of his questions, many questions. So the Virgin of Rav says to him, tell me something and be honest. Did these questions occur to you before you leave the yeshiva and leave everything and go to your academic way? Or did you have these questions right when you left? He turns to his Rebbe, he says, with all honesty, I didn't have these questions when I was here. I had these questions, true, when I left. So the Volozhin Rav says to him, then you don't have questions. You have shuvot, you have answers, you have excuses. Sometimes we like to have these questions as weapons to use to, you know, kind of escape from the responsibility of life. We like to have these questions in order to use it as an excuse and say, yeah, this is why I am the way I am. Because, why did so and so happen? We use it as weapons, but they don't work. That's what we do in life. What do you, these are all, these are all, uh, you know, think about it. If you think about it, in the scientific world, uh, the Big Bang Theory, or evolution. You have no idea how much evidence there is for the existence of God and creation. No idea. It's quite in your face. Yet, scientists will do everything in their power with very little evidence to say that there is no reason to believe in God. Why? Simple. Because if you do believe in God, then you no longer have an excuse for the way you lead your life. Then now you have to be responsible for your actions. I've said this many, many times, and I'll say it again. Morality comes from the Torah. The center of our morale comes from the Torah. If there is no Torah, if there is no morality, then there's nothing. If a person doesn't believe in God, if people just don't believe in God, and if we believe that everything is an accident, then what do you do? What do you do with an accident? You spill milk. What do you do with spilled milk accidentally? You clean it up. That's what world is coming to right now. That's why life has no value. Because when you teach people that the world came to by an accident, and there is no God, there is no responsibility, then why would killing someone be a problem? Then why would stealing be a problem? If there is no judgment in the world to come, if there is no punishment for wrongdoing, then why do we, do we need to ask further as to why these things, people do the, the horrible things that they do? So, 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 when do you think that comes in? It's, when do you think the question of whether God exists or not comes in? It only comes in after the fact. When you want to believe that there is no God, then you start working on questions to support your case. But if you really, really want to believe, if you really have questions that you want answers for, the answers are there. They're very, very clear. I once asked, I don't know if I shared this with you guys or not, um, on one of my trips in Israel, I had the honor of being with a 
um, having a conversation with a very high-ranked general in the Sahal army. And I asked them this question. I said, do you believe in miracles? He's been through many, many wars. He's fought many wars, him and his kids. And I really wanted to know what he believes when he fights these wars. And I said, do you believe in miracles? I never forget the face on him. I never forget the way he smirked and smiled at me as if I just asked him the dumbest question. <laughs> he looked at me and he said, what? He said, you don't understand. Every single fight we've ever had, every single war we've ever had, I have seen miracles beyond belief. Everything from A to Z has been miraculous. There's no question about it. Because when you want to see, you'll see it. I was speaking to a doctor the other day, and he came up to me and he said, Rabbi, this coronavirus, and he's not, he's not, he's not, I, I wouldn't call him, you know, uh, uh, ultra orthodox or whatever. You know, he's a traditional Jew. He says to me, Rabbi, with this coronavirus, if you don't believe in the plagues of God, if you don't believe in the hand of God, you are stupid and you're fooling yourself. This is what he told me directly. He said, you don't understand what we've experienced and we've seen. This is only God, period. A person has to be foolish not to believe in the emet and still have questions. So why do people ask questions, he says? People are afraid of the truth because it's going to make them change their, their, their direction in life. Or at least it's going to give them hardship in life. A lot of people come and say, I have a lot of questions. I myself... I myself had, had, have had people ask me questions without wanting the answer, and it drives me crazy. I, I, I did a funeral once, Barminan, and somebody came to me after I spoke, came up to me and he said, Rabbi, I'm sorry, just, Rabbi, do you really believe, do you, is there really a world to come, the next world? So I, 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 I felt, I, I knew where this is going. And I really, those that know me, I don't have patience for this stuff. So I said, do you really want to know? Are you, are you really asking me? He's like, no, really, I want to know. I, I want to know, like, is there really a, a different world, a next world? I said, absolutely, there's a lot of evidence to you. He absolutely, he didn't even let me finish my sentence. He said, there isn't, trust me. I'm telling you, there is nothing beyond. So, I'm like, I said to him, I'm sorry. I thought you, ha you, you said you had a question. He said, I did. I said, no, you didn't have a question. You had an answer. You just wasted my time here. You asked me a question just to pose your own answer on me. I'm not interested. Please, next time. You want to ask a question? Say you have a question. If you have an answer or a comment, just say, Rabbi, I want to make a comment. Don't waste my time. There are a lot of people out there that just have answers. Why? Because they don't want the responsibility of life. Why does he want to not believe in the next world when there is so much evidence of it? Because if I believe in the next world, somehow I'm going to be responsible and I can't say Lashon Hara, I can't steal people's money, I can't desecrate the Shabbat, I can't eat whatever I want whenever I want, so I'm comfortable. But it's the stupidest ideology. Because whether you believe in it or not, whether you have these questions or not, at the end of the day, we're all going to the same place. The difference is going to be, you're going to be surprised, others are not. You're going to be shocked when Hashem says to you, no, what are you going to say? Uh, I led a life of emptiness because I have questions. Please, you think no one else had questions? Hashem is going to bring Avraham Avinu to your face. Avraham Avinu didn't have questions. Moshe Rabbeinu didn't have questions. They all had questions. But they searched for an answer. You had answers hit you in the face on a daily basis. And what did you do? No. It's not true. No, it doesn't exist. No. Trust me. Trust me. I love it. 
when people that have almost no education in Torah life, somehow they have all the answers when it comes to Torah and mitzvot. I love it. You go, you, you have the CDC and you have the scientists telling us exactly what to do on a daily basis when it comes to the coronavirus and it's changing on an hourly basis. Wear a mask, don't wear a mask. Close your eyes, don't close your eyes. Breathe out, don't breathe out. Sing in shul, don't sing in shul. There's tons and tons of things. Surfaces are dangerous, surfaces are not dangerous. Surfaces are dangerous and we believe every single word they have to tell us. On a daily basis, we're like, oh, CDC said, okay, okay, CDC. CDC is like the god of science today, chas shalom. And we're not educated in it, so we listen. A person goes to their doctor, the doctor says, you need to take these antibiotics. What do we do? No, trust me, doctor, I don't need to. I know, trust me. It's okay, thank you. That's what we do? It's ridiculous to even think that. Why? Because we're uneducated in that field. Or else why would we go to the doctor? Why don't we diagnose ourselves? We go to the doctor because we're not educated in that field. So when the doctor tells us something, we trust their education. However, when it comes to Judaism, kulanu hachamim, kulanu nevonim, kulanu tzadikim, we all become hachamim. We're all tzadikim. We know the entire Torah. Why? Because maybe some of us read the art scroll translation once. And therefore, we know everything the Torah has to offer. So when you tell me not to desecrate the Shabbat, I know, trust me, it's okay. When you tell me Kashrut is important, no, is it was for that time. In that time, there was a lot of sickness. So people should watch what they eat. It's not for our time. Or, 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 or Tzara'at that I've heard. This was the most amusing one. Tzara'at that came, that the Torah says came because a person that spoke to Lashon Hara and it was a sign that would go on a person's walls and their clothes and then afterwards if they didn't listen it would be on their own body. It was mildew. All along we and the Chachamim in all these generations, the Kohen Gadol, the Kohanim for thousands of years we've been dealing with mildew and we didn't even know. Why? Because all the experts in the Torah don't know anything. And some guy that went to some university all of a sudden has figured everything out. Hazaku Baruch. It's ludicrous. It's stupid. It's all excuses. We, we use these things to, 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 to add to the flames of our irresponsibility in life. We want to be irresponsible. We want to do what we want. We want to eat what we want to eat. It's very simple. That's what life has become when a person doesn't pay attention to the direction they're going. And then when they wake up and they go, oh my gosh, I shouldn't be doing these things. So, but I love it, but I enjoy it. So what do I do? Who says it's wrong to do anyway? Who says God exists? Who says there's any, ah, do whatever you want. This is life. YOLO. They say a story about Rav Baruch Mebezbuz, who was, <clears throat> who was um, the grandson of the Baal Shem Tov. The grandson of the Baal Shem Tov, Rav Baruch was sitting and he was learning. And his grandson, that was a little boy, came in crying. And he couldn't calm him down. And at, finally, <coughs> he asked him, I want to know why, why are you so sad? Why are you crying? The grandson answers him and he says, as tears are rolling down his cheeks, uh, they were playing hide and seek with his friends and it was his turn to hide. And so, very excitedly, he went to hide. So the Rav says, okay, so what's the problem? He says, but Zaidi, no one came to find me. I was hiding for 10, 15, 20 minutes. They didn't even try to hide me, find me. To which Rav Baruch starts to cry. And now his grandson is asking him, Zaidi, why are you crying? It's not a big deal. He says, you just taught me a valuable lesson. The Shekhinah is also crying all the time. 
God's presence is also crying for the same reason. He says, I'm hiding and so many of my children don't even bother to try to find me. It's so easy for them to say, nah, forget it. Why even pursue it? I don't even want to know the purpose of life. I don't want to know where God is. I don't know. I don't want to know how he acts. I don't, ah, he doesn't even exist. Really? A person in life searches for many, many things except for the godliness within them. We all see it. Many people see miracles upon miracles on a weekly, daily, minute, Hourly basis. Who doesn't see all the ashkaha, the divine providence of God in, in health, in parnasa, in the way the world runs? I mean, crazy things on a daily basis. A person just has to look. And a person will really recognize God's presence. And the greatest, the greatest is in Shiduchim. If a person does not see Hashem's presence when two people meet to be married and a person finds a zivug, one person on this side of the world, the other person on the other side of the world, and somehow they come together in some freak accident, you don't see hands of, the hand of God, ah, you're not looking. And this, Rabbi Mendel, the Kotsky Rebbe, the Rabbi Mendel of Kotsk says, Yesh anashim HaKadosh Baruch the Gotske Rebbe says there are those that will actually see God Himself. God could come down and say, Okay, Habibi, I am God. Okay? And they will still not be moved. Because we have we've trained our minds and our hearts. So much to believe in the nothing because we want the life that we want. God himself could appear. Like I said, last week I think we said this. That um, yeah, we did, we did mention it. But on the Torah, the Torah, the Torah, the Torah, the Torah, says that when the Jews came to Mount Sinai, they saw everything from far. And he asks, can you possibly see such amazing Shekhinah Hashem and still stay as far as you want? Our rabbis tell us that the greatness of Rabbi Akiva was all from the Musar that he learned from a rock. You could either be like Rabbi Akiva or you could be the way we are sometimes. Rabbi Akiva for 40 years didn't know any Torah whatsoever. However, he, he got Musar from one thing that he saw in, 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 in a river. He saw a rock and there was water, like a tiny little waterfall coming down and there was drops of water, droplets falling on this rock. And he sees the place that these droplets had fallen on the rock slowly had penetrated the rock, making a hole in it. To which he said, this rock that is solid, for years these droplets have been entering it and finally making a hole in it. My heart is flesh and blood. I'm sure Torah will also penetrate it. Let me go and study. He could have been a hard-headed and said, I'm 40 years old, I'm done. You know what? I got a lot of questions, no answers. Why should I even bother myself? And then lead another 40, 50 years of emptiness. There's a lot of older people, older generation that look back and, you know, I've heard of people, Rahman al-Istan, Arminan, on their deathbed, that, that, that cry because they wasted their entire life. 
because they, they came up with excuses as to why not do better. But our generation, we're a generation of lies. There are people that know the truth, find the truth, but they won't change. Why? Social pressures. What will my friends say? What will my family say? How could a person, sometimes a person asks, how can I agree? How can I admit that I've been living a lie until now? It's very difficult to change. It's very difficult for a person to come and change at one point and say, you know what, yeah, I have been living a lie until now. I want to change now. And if there is one person we should learn this from is Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva did it at a very old age. At a very old age. And he became someone that we say, the Midrash says, Moshe Rabbeinu asked Hashem, God showed Moshe Rabbeinu the future, and Moshe Rabbeinu saw Rabbi Akiva. And he turns to Hashem and he says, Ribbono Shel Olam, why didn't you give the Torah to him? Imagine for Moshe Rabbeinu to say, the Torah should have been given to Rabbi Akiva. And he was a person that was completely off until age 40. Moshe Rabbeinu wasn't off until age 40. There wasn't even Torah at that time, Moshe Rabbeinu. At Rabbi Akiva's time, there was Torah, there was the Bit HaMikdash, and he was completely off. But he changed everything. It is not late. We have to learn that if we have questions, it doesn't mean that there are no answers. Sometimes it just means that we can't understand the answers now. But that doesn't mean everything is pointless in life. Our purpose has to be to find reason and to find the purpose of our world, our life in this world. And with that, Be'ezrat Hashem will be able to get closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, like the Ramchal says, that purpose brings us to really get closer to Hashem and that truly is the end game, the main, main purpose of life in this world. Baruch Adonai Le'olam, Amen ve'amen.